second what happened. Can you see the PowerPoint for the chapter chapter 18 in coastal noise? Prostaglandins, thromboxins, nutrients, and related compounds. Are you able to see it? Come on, Yes, though. No. Okay. Okay, so for the eicosanoids, we are going to talk first about the arachidonic acid. Okay. Since the arachidonic acid is the precursor for the eicosanoids. So arachidonic acid is a is also known as the 5-8-11-14 eicosatetraenoic acid, and it is the most abundant uh, of the eicosanoid precursors. It is also a uh, 20 carbon fatty acid, which contains four double bonds. And the first double bond will actually occurs at the at six carbon, at the six carbons from the methyl end. That's why it the arachidonic acid it all, is also known as a is an omega six fatty acid. Okay. So we are we start here at the methyl end. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So at the fifth, at the at carbon fifteen, we have the double bond. So we call it as omega six fatty acid. So in order for the arachidonic acid to, to become a cosanoid, they must first be released from the membrane phospholipids because they are uh, they are stored in the membrane phospholipids and it is through the uh, lipases, the phospholipids wherein they are being released or mobilized. So there are three classes of phospholipases which contributes to the arachidonic release from the membrane lipids. So we have the cytosolic uh, phospholipase A, uh, secretory, and we also have the calcium independent. So chemical and physical stimuli activates the calcium dependent translocation of the cytosolic uh, PLA2 to the plasma membranes where it releases arachidonic acid for the metabolism into eicosanoids. In contrast, under non-stimulated conditions, um, arachidonic acid is liberated by the by the calcium independent PLA2, <laughs> which is uh, incorporated into the cell membranes. So, in other words, uh, using the phospholipase A to the calcium independent, there's a uh, negligible eicosanoid biosynthesis. So while cytosolic PLA2 dominate in the acute release, so it is the acute, it is the acute release of arachidonic acid, the one that is, um, uh, the reason for that would be the cytosolic uh, phospholipase A2. While the secretory PLA2 is induced under conditions of sustained or intense stimulation of the arachidonic acid production. So there are, um, there are uh, different, what do you call this? There are different routes, routes that, uh, that the arachidonic acid uh, go through after being mobilized from the membrane phospholipids. So we have the, they can be um, converted or the pathway we, they can undergo the pathway that uses the cyclooxygenase, the lipoxygenase. We, they can also uh, go to the pathway that uses the cytochrome P450, and they can also go to the isoecosanoid pathway, which does not use any enzyme. In other words, they only use uh, free radicals in order to be converted to isoprostase. 
So again, uh, our hydrochloric acid can undergo cyclooxygenase pathway and can go to the hypoxygenase pathway, also to the cytochrome P450 or the P450 epoxygenase pathway, as well as the isoacosanoid pathway. So for the products in, uh, of the cyclooxygenase, before that, we are going to talk first about the Cyclooxygenase being used, the, the two enzymes. We, we have here the COX-1 and the COX-2. So COX-1, also known as the prostaglandin synthase 1, while COX-2 is the synthase 2. So COX-1 generates prostanoids for housekeeping functions, such as gastric epithelial cytoprotection. While the COX-2 uh, is a major source of prostanoid in uh, inflammation and cancer. And it is the immediate early response gene product and markedly upregulated by sheer stress, stress, growth factors, tumor promoters, and cytokines. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs exert their therapeutic effect through the inhibition of the, of the cyclooxygenases. And most other NSAIDs like the endomethacine, sulindac, metoprenamate, ibuprofen, they non-selectively inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. And for the selective COX-2 inhibitors, they follow out, these are the different COX-2 inhibitors, which follows the order for increasing COX-2 selectivities, having heterotoxib as the highest selectivity for COX-2, while cytotoxib with the least selectivity for COX-2. Maliktad, a selective... Telecoxib has the least, but the end of the heterocoxib has the highest selectivity, while the celecoxib has the least selectivity for toxin. For aspirin, it is also an answer, but it has a different uh, mechanism. It irreversibly inhibits both tox1 and tox2. For low doses, it inhibits platelet tox1, whereas if there's higher doses of aspirin, it can inhibit both the systemic tox1 and tox2. Again, for low doses, the aspirin can inhibit, inhibit the platelet tox1 alone. But if, if given in higher doses, maapektuhan ng tox1 and tox2 a systemic. So we have here, a figure that shows the prostanoid biosynthesis. So if we can see here from the arachidonic acid, both COX-1 and COX-2 function as homodimers, which is uh, inserted into the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum to promote the uptake of the two molecules of oxygen by cyclization of arachidonic acid, which will lead to the product known as the PGG2. This is, is this an uh, uh, unstable product that is rapidly modified by the peroxidase moiety of the COX enzyme in order to add a 15 hydroxyl group, this one, the hydroxyl group, which is essential for the biologic activity. This will then form the prostaglandin uh, PGH2, I mean, I'm sorry, the PGH2. This is also unstable and it will be will then be subsequently um, converted into the different um, the different prostaglandins as well as prostacycline and thromboxane. Okay, so for COX-1 and COX-2 homodimers, the, the one, one protomer would act as the catalytic unit binding for arachidonic acid for the oxygenation, while the other acts as, a, as an allosteric modifier of catalytic activity. So uh, the, the substances formed are called prostanoids. These are the, the prostaglandin, prostacycline, and the thromboxines are collectively called as prostanoids. So they are generated from the PGH2 through the action of the downstream isomerases and synthase. So, so again, this is the prostacycline synthase, the PGIS, the thromboxane synthase, uh, which produces the thromboxane, and the PGF synthase, which produces the prostaglandins. 
These terminal enzymes are expressed in a relatively cell-specific fashion such that most cells make one or two dominant prostaglandins. So the prostaglandins differ from each other in two ways. First is the substituents of the pentene ring, and second in the number of double bonds in the side chains, which is um, indicated by the subscript. This is a subscript, by the way, one, two, and the letters indicate the substituents of the pentene ring. So several products of the arachidonic acid series are of current clinical importance. We have the alprostadil, which is PGE1, prostaglandin E1, is used for the smooth muscle relaxing effects to maintain the doctor's arteriosis patent in some neonates awaiting cardiac surgery and as well as for the treatment of impotence. Misoprostol is a derivative of the prostaglandin E1. It is a cytoprotective prostaglandin used in preventing peptic ulcer. And if combined with mifeprestone, it is used for terminating early pregnancy. So it is about the fashion. Dinoprostone, which is PGE2 and PGF2 alpha, are used in obstetrics in obstetric to induce labor. And the tonoprost are topically active PGF2 alpha derivatives used in ophthalmology to reduce intraocular pressure, pressure in open angle glaucoma or ocular hypertension. We also have prostacycline, which is synthesized mainly by the vascular endothelium and is a powerful vasodilator and inhibitor of platelet aggregation. So the uh, ania opposite is the thromboxane, which causes the platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. All the naturally occurring tox products undergo rapid metabolism to inactive products either through hydration or by oxidation by the prostaglandin 15 hydroxy prostaglandin dehydrogenase, also known as the 15 p So it is the substance or the enzyme that, that the inactivates that metabolize these uh, tox products. Further metabolism is by the by these uh, processes. The metabolism by the, okay, okay sorry. The pro products of lipo lipoxygenase naman, the, the products for this would be the, what do you call this, leukotrienes. So there are three uh, enzymes used for the lipoxygenase pathway. We have the 5 lipoxygenase, 12, and the 15 lipoxygenase. However, we, we, uh, the most actively investigated pathway is uh, using the 5 lipoxygenase because, it, as mentioned, it gives rise to the leukotrienes. And as the name implies, leukotrienes, it is present in leukocytes and other inflammatory cells like mast cells and dendritic cells. It is also associated with asthma anaphylactic shock, and cardiovascular disease. So stimulation of these cells elevates the intracellular calcium and again will release the arachidonic acid. And there will be incorporation of molecular oxygen by the 5 lipoxygenase with the help of the, five, the flap, which is the 5 lipoxygenase activating protein. And this will lead to the production of the 5S-HPETE, which is then further converted by the 5-lipoxygenase into an unstable epoxide known as the leukotriene A4. From, from here, it is either converted by the LTA4 hydrolase or the LTC4 synthase. If it is produced, it, I mean, if it is um, converted by the LTA4 hydrolase, it will be converted into LTB4. But if it is through the LTC4 synthase, the LTA4 will be conjugated with glutathione. And, and the resulting product will be LTC4, which will be further converted into LTB4 and, to, and LTA4. And this, the C, D, and E leukotrienes are also known as the cystinyl leukotrienes. Okay. Although 
as I mentioned again, as mentioned as I mentioned a while ago, eucotrines are found in leukocytes. However, there is also a uh, production of of leukotrienes by the by non-leukocyte cells. This happens if the non-leukocyte cells has enzymes that uh, causes uh, that converts. I mean the LPA4. So from here downwards, it can be observed in non-leukocyte cells such as the endothelial cells. The LPA4 is the primary product, primary and stable product of the 5 lipoxygenase, and it can also be converted uh, with appropriate stimulation via the 12 lipoxygenase in platelets in vitro to the lipoxins A4 and B4. The LTC4 and the LTD4 are potent bronchoconstrictors and are secreted in asthma and anaphylaxis. Again, LPC4 and LTD4 are, are included in the group known as the cystinyl leukotrienes. There are four current approaches to anti-leukotrien drug development. So we use the, the inhibitors for the 5 like oxygenase enzyme. We can also do the antagonist for the cystinyl eugotriene receptors. FLAP can also be inhibited, and as well as the phospholipase A2. The 15 lipoxygenase 1 isoform prefers linoleic acid as a substrate instead of the arachidonic acid. It forms the 13S hydroxyoctodecadienoic acid. And the sequential action of this, a 15 lux one and 5 lux can convert the omega-3 fatty acid to resolvins, which is wherein the resolvins are potentially anti-inflammatory pro-resolving lipids. So 12 HEPE is a product of 12 lipoxygenase pathway, and it can also undergo a catalyzed molecular rearrangement to epoxy hydroxy a cosatine in a weak acid called hypoxylines. So hypoxylines also have uh, pro-inflammatory effects. Although um, the, bio the biological relevance of these hypoxylines are still unclear on how, how they play in our body. Specific isozymes of microsome, this one is for the epoxygenase pathway. So, they use the cytochrome P450 monoxygenase and they convert the arachidonic acid to hydroxy or epoxy acosatinoic acid. We have um, the cytochrome P hydroxylases, uh, like the CYP3A, 4A, 4F, which can lead to the production of the 20 HEE. While the epoxygenases can lead to the production of the EETs, the 5, 6, the 8, 9, 11, 12, and the 14, 15 EETs. So the biologic actions of the EETs are reduced by their conversion to the corresponding and biologically less active dihydroxy acosatinoic acids or the DETs through the action of the soluble epoxide hydrolase. So again, the EETs are being converted using the soluble epoxide hydrolase into a lesser uh, active dihydroxy acid. acids. Unlike the prostaglandins, EETs can be esterified into phospholipids. In other words, they can act as storage sites. So intracellular fatty acid binding proteins promote the uptake of EETs into the cells and it incorporates into phospholipids and availability to SEH or the soluble epoxide hydrolase. They are all they are synthesized in endothelial cells and they can cause vasodilation in a number of vascular beds by activating the calcium activated potassium channels in the smooth muscle. This results in the hyperpolarization and vasodilation, which leads to the reduction of the blood pressure. The 15S hydroxy 11 to PET, which arises from the 15 lipoxygenase pathway, 
is also an endothelium derived hyperpolarizing factor and is also a substrate for the SEH. General response to the EET is uh, it acts as vasodilators. However, they also cause vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature. This activity of EETs can limit the potential clinical use of the SEH inhibitor. Anti-inflammatory, anti-apoptotic, and pro-angiogenic actions of the EETs have also been reported. Okay. Why do you think that uh, uh, the activity of EETs because of the but because of its effect on the pulmonary vasculature can limit the potential use of SPH inhibitors. Yes. Anyone? Again, SEH is the um, enzyme that metabolizes the EETs into a into DEX, DHET, which is which has lesser um, activity. If we give S the SEH inhibitor, what will happen? Again, EETs, its general uh, response would be they cause vasodilation, but in the in the lungs, they can cause vasoconstriction. So if the if the enzyme that, that metabolizes the EETs is being inhibited, so there are more EETs in the system. So if the EETs causes vasoconstriction in the pulmonary vasculature, and, and SEH inhibitors are being given, then we'll, there will be prominent vasoconstriction in the, in the, in the lungs. Okay. okay, now we go to the isoicosanoids. So isoicosanoids are is a family of acosanoid isomers and they are formed done enzymatically. So again, in the, the four pathways for the arachidonic acid, three is enzymatic pathways, while this one is the non-enzymatic pathway for arachidonic acid. So this is uh, uh, the isoacosanoids are formed by the direct free radical base action on the arachidonic acid and related lipid substrates. So isoprostanes are uh, that is formed are prostaglandin stereoisomers. Uh, okay. So since uh, silic, oh, sorry, sorry. Cyclooxygenase is not needed for the formation of isoprostanes. So, in other words, if uh, if the cyclooxygenase is inhibited with aspirin or other NSAIDs, um, it will not affect the the production of isoicosanoids because it does not affect the isoprostane pathway. It's a different pathway from the cyclooxygenase. The primary epimerization mechanism is through the peroxidation of the arachidonic acid by the free radicals. Okay, free radicals would include the superoxides, the hydrogen peroxide, etc. So peroxidation occurs while arachidonic acid is still esterified to the membrane phospholipid. So even though other pahira, they are still uh, part of the membrane phospholipid, they can already undergo peroxidation, which can uh, form diisoicosanoids. So again, unlike prostaglandins, these stereoisomers are stored as part of the membrane. They are then cleaved by phospholipases, like the phospholipase A2, and they circulate and are excreted in the urine. Isoprostins are present in relatively large amounts, a tenfold greater in blood and urine than the cyclooxygenase derived prostaglandins since again they are they are already formed and stored in the membrane phospholipids so if they are if they are being cleaved by phospholipids bagan mas derdamo tira amount 
kay Sahit Cyclops CGNAs wherein they are still being formed outside. I mean, the, uh, after ma ma mobilize yah from the membrane phospholipids, they these isoclasonides have potent vasoconstrictor effects when when infused into renal and other vascular beds and may activate prostonide receptors. They also may modulate other aspects of vascular functions like leukocyte and platelet adhesive interactions and angiogenesis. So basic pharmacology of eicosanoids, eicosanoids have short half-lives and they act mainly in an autoprint and paraprint fashion. So again, they are they function or they act uh, near the site of the cell, of their cell synthesis and they do not circulate like, uh, like other hormones. So all receptors are G-protein coupled and the PP2, PP4, IP, and DP1 receptors activate adenylcyclase via GS since again they are G-protein coupled and as mentioned, this is the aforementioned receptors. Um, uh, the, it, their post receptor mechanism is the mobilization of the alpha subunit GS. The, I mean, the G protein alpha subunit S. Okay, so GS would increase the intracellular count level and in turn will activate the, the specific protein kinase that causes an effect. So we have here a table which shows the different eicosanoid receptors and the, their endogenous ligands as well as secondary ligands, as well as the alpha subunits of the G protein with the corresponding second messenger if it increases or decreases, and their major phenotypes in knockout mice. Okay. For example, we have here the DP1 receptor wherein the, the endogenous ligand would be the prostaglandin 2, uh, D2, I mean, which is a, uh, which activates, or I mean, which releases the alpha subunit S of the G protein, and the effect would be a decrease of allergic asthma and increase in inflammatory cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and thrombosis. If mapapansin niyo, uh, mostly if um, they correspond to each other, like DP1, PGD2, DP2, PGD2, the E, the EP1 receptor, prostaglandin E2, so it's a bit easier to familiarize. Okay, so for the PP1, FP, and the PP receptor, they activate the phosphatidine, phosphatidyl inositol metabolism through the GQ sub, alpha subunit. So they increase the IP3 and the calcium. The TP also receptor also focus to multiple G proteins, which includes the G12-13 and G16, which stimulate small G protein signaling pathways and we activate or inhibit adenylcyclase via the GS or the GI respectively. EP3 isomers, isoforms I mean, can couple to both increased intracellular calcium and to increased or decreased GAM. So there are other receptors that can, uh, that has um, both effect, both uh, found in the GS and the, and the GQ. DP2 receptors, the prostaglandin D2 receptors, also known as the chemoattractant receptor homologous molecule, which is expressed on the T helper 2 cells, or also known as the CRTH2. This, is, this receptor is unrelated to other prostaglandin receptors and is a member of the FMLP receptor superfamily. DP2 receptors topos through a GI type of G protein and leads to the inhibition of gum synthesis and it increases the intracellular calcium in a variety of cell types. For BLP1 receptor, it causes inositol triphosphatylase 
which causes the activation, the granulation, and superoxide and ion generation leukocytes. We also have the cis leukotriene 1 and cis leukotriene 2 receptors that topples to the GQ type of G protein, which leads to the increase in the cellular calcium. And studies have also placed GI dust downstream of the cis leukotriene 2. Next, we have the EET is promote vasodilation via the paraffin activation of the calcium activated potassium channels on smooth muscle cells, which leads to the hyperpolarization and relaxation. It occurs in a manner consistent with the activation of the GS coupled receptor, but the specific EET receptor has yet to be identified. EET may also act in an autocrine manner, which directly activates the endothelial transit receptor potential channels, which causes endothelial hyperpolarization. It is then transferred to the smooth muscle cells by gap junctions or the potassium ions. Specific receptors for the isoprostings have not been identified yet. The ones that is produced by the, by the non-enzymatic pathway. So there's no receptors that have been identified yet. Biological importance of their capacity to act as incidental ligands it remains to be established as well. Although prostanoids can activate peroxisome proliferator activated receptors, which also known as a TPARS, if added in sufficient concentration in vitro, it remains questionable whether these compounds ever attain concentrations to function as endogenous nuclear receptor ligands in vivo. The major effects of prostaglandin and thromboxine include smooth muscle in the smooth muscle in the vasculature areas and GI and reproductive tracts. So they cause contraction, they cause, I mean, they cause contraction of smooth muscle, which is mediated by the release of calcium, while the relaxing effects are mediated by the generation of the camp. Many of the eicosanides contractile effects on smooth muscle can be inhibited by lowering the extracellular calcium or by using calcium channel blockers. Other important targets for the prostaglandins and thromboxins are the platelets and monocyte kidneys, the CNS, the autonomic presynaptic nerve terminals, sensory nerve endings, endocrine organs, adipose tissues, and the eyes, specifically the smooth muscle of the eye. For the smooth muscle, the vascular effect, the vascular smooth muscle effect, I mean, the thromboxin A2 is a potent vasoconstrictor mentioned a while ago. And an iacabolic taran would be the prostacycline or the PGI2. The thromboxin is the only eicosanoid that is shown to act as a smooth muscle mitogen. It is potentiated by the exposure of smooth muscle cells to testosterone, which upregulates the smooth, mu muscles, smooth muscle cell PP expression. We also have the pgf 2 alpha, which is also a of constrictor, but it's not a smooth muscle mitogen. When we talk about mitogen, what does it mean? I'm not really sure of the pronunciation, by the way, if it's mitogen or mitogen. When we say um, mitogen, it means that it acts, uh, it, it uh, triggers the mitosis of that smooth muscle cell. So th that's why it's called as mitogen. So the thromboxin A2 is a smooth muscle cell mitogen, while the PGF2 is not. Another most vasoconstrictor is the isoprostin 8 iso pgf 2 alpha, uh, which may act via the TP receptor. The PGI2 and the, or the prostacycline and the prostaglandin E2 promotes vasodilation by increasing the TAM and decreasing smooth muscle intracellular calcium, primarily through the IP or the EP4 receptors. So for the vascular P prostacycline, they are synthesized by both smooth muscle and endothelial cells with the COX-2 isoform in the latter cell type being the major contributor. So again, 
is the COX-2 that is the major contributor for the production of the vascular PGI-2 or the process typing by both smooth muscle cell and endothelial cell. PGE2 or the prostaglandin E2 is a vasodilator produced by the endothelial cells in the microcirculation, hence in the capillaries. The prostaglandin it inhibits proliferation of smooth muscle cells, which is an action that may be particularly relevant in pulmonary hypertension. So again, kabalik talan niya ang thromboxane. Since thromboxane is a mutagen, while Prostacycline inhibits the proliferation or the, or the mitosis of the smooth muscle cells. We also have PGD2 may also function as a vasodilator, in particular as a dominant mediator of flushing induced by the lipid-lowering drug niacin. And for the GIP smooth muscles, uh, most of the prostaglandins and thromboxanes activate the gastrointestinal smooth muscle since again, the GI smooth muscle is sensitive. Longitudinal muscle is contracted by the prostaglandin E2 through the EP3 receptor and prostaglandin F2 alpha via F3 receptor, while the circular muscle is contracted strongly by the PGF2 alpha and weakly by the prostacycline. It is also relaxed by the prostaglandin E2 through the AP4 receptor. Administration of either the PGE2 or PGF2 alpha will result to colic cramps. The leukotriens also have powerful contractile effects. For the, air, the smooth muscles in the airways, respiratory smooth muscle is relaxed by these two, um, these two prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline and they are contracted by the PGD2 from boxane and PGF2 alpha. The cystinyl leukotrienes, again, the cystinyl leukotrienes, the LTC, LTD, and the LTE4. I mean, LTC4, LTD4, LTE4. So they are the cystinyl leukotrienes. They are also bronchoconstrictors. They act principally on smooth muscles in the peripheral airways, and they are a thousand times more potent than histamine. They stimulate bronchial mucus secretion and causes mucosal edema. Bronchial spasm occurs in about 10% of people taking NSAIDs, possibly because there, is, there will be a shift in the arachidonic acid metabolism. So instead of the COX metabolism, since they are taking NSAIDs, which inhibits the COX pathway, they will then go to the lipoxygenase pathway, which forms the leukotrienes. And, and as mentioned, leukotrienes are bronchoconstrictors. For the platelets, platelet aggregation is markedly affected by eicosanoids. The prostacycline, which is a major product of the COX-2, and the derived COX-2, is a potent inhibitor of the platelet aggregation, as mentioned a while ago. It inhi its inhibition occurs via an IP receptor-dependent elevation in the GS activity and CA. Dysfunctional genetic variants in the human prostacycline receptor as well as drug inhibition of COX-2 will lead to increased platelet activation and aggregation. Since again, receptor for prostacycline will lead to the um, inhibition of platelet aggregation. So without the prostacycline receptor, or if, this, if there are defects in the prostacycline receptor, the prostacycline will not be able to attach. Hence, there will be increased platelet activation and aggregation. For the thromboxine, uh, they, these are the major products of the platelet COX-1 and the only COX isoform expressed in mature platelets with COX-1 derived PGD2 found in lesser amounts. They are powerful inducers of platelet aggregation. Again, prostacycline is to inhibition of platelet aggregation, while thromboxane is an inducer of platelet aggregation. They additionally amplify the effects of other more potent platelet agonists such as thrombin. The TPGQ signaling pathway elevates intracellular calcium and activates the protein kinase C which facilitates the platelet aggregation and thromboxane biosynthesis. The activation of the G12 G13 
induces the row or, or the row time is dependent regulation of the myosin light chain phosphorylation, which leads to the platelet shape change. And because of this platelet shape change, they tend to aggregate. The platelet action of the thromboxane A2 are restrained in vivo by the prostacycline, which inhibits platelet aggregation by all recognized ag agonists and PGD2. So again, prostacycline helps in the inhibition for anything that can cause platelet aggregation. The platelet oxygen derived thromboxane biosynthesis is increased during platelet activation and aggregation. So it irreversibly inhibited by chronic administration of aspirin at low doses. During urinary metabolites, a thromboxane increase in clinical syndromes of platelet activation, such as diabetes, and particularly in patients with MI and stroke. Macrophage TOX2 appears to contribute roughly 10% of the increment in thromboxin biosynthesis observed in smokers, while the rest is derived from platelet TOX1. Low concentrations of the prostaglandin E2 enhance, whereas higher concentrations inhibit the platelet aggregation. The prostaglandin D2, however, inhibits aggregation via the BP1 receptor, which leads to the increased CAP generation. In the kidney, both the medulla and the cortex of the kidney synthesize prostaglandins, but the medulla uh, produces substantially more prostaglandins than the cortex. The COX1 is expressed mainly in the cortical and medullary collecting ducts, dendritic cells, Arterial, arteriolar endothelium and epithelial cells of Bowman's capsule, while the COX-2 is restricted to the renal medullary interstitial cells, the macula densa, and the cortical thick of ascending limb. And the major renal eicosanoid products are the prostaglandin E2 and the prostacycline, which is followed by the PGF2-alpha and the thromboxane. The kidney also synthesizes several hydroxy acid, acid, eucotriens, cytochrome B450 products, and epoxides. For the prostaglandins in the kidney maintains the blood pressure and also reg regulates renal function. So for the maintenance of blood pressure, they modulate systemic blood pressure through the regulation of the excretions of water and sodium. For the regulation of renal function, the renal cortical talks to derive prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline, maintain, they maintain renal blood flow and glomerular, glomerular fluctuation rate through the local vasodilating effect. So if it vasodilates, it, uh, the effect would be a better blood flow by the renal artery, I mean by the renal blood vessel. Expression of the medulla, medullary COX-2 and the MPGS-1 is increased under the condition of high salt intake. The COX-2-derived prostanoids includes, increases medullary blood flow and inhibit tubular sodium reabsorption. The COX-1-derived products then promote salt excretion in the collecting ducts. So increased Water clearance probably results from an attenuation of the action of the antidiuretic hormone on the adenylocyclase. Loss of these effects may underlie the systemic or salt sensitive hypertension often associated with tox inhibition. The loop diuretics, uh, like the furosemide, they produce some of their effect by uh, stimulating tox activity. So they act like what the cyclooxygenase. Uh, does. So in the normal kidney, this, kid, this increases the synthesis of the vasodilator prostaglandins. Therefore, patient response to a loop diuretic is diminished if a COX inhibitor is administered concurrently. In contrast to the medullary enzyme, cortical, cortical so COX-2 expression is increased by low salt intake, which would lead to the increased renin release. And because of the increase in the renin release, 
it will elevate the malar penetration rate and contributes to enhance sodium reabsorption and will, there will be a rise in blood pressure. So prostaglandin E2 is thought to stimulate training release through the activation of either EP4 or the EP2 receptor. The prostacycline can also stimulate renin release. It may be relevant to the maintenance of blood pressure in volume contracted conditions and to the pathogenesis of the renovascular hypertension. The inhibition of the COX-2 may reduce blood pressure in this setting. The thromboxane will cause intravenal vessel constriction and perhaps an antidiuretic hormone-like effect, which results in a decline in renal function. The normal kidney synthesizes only small amounts of thromboxane. So if there is a release of substantial amounts of thromboxane, then there might be inflammatory cell infiltration, like the glomerulonephritis and renal transplant rejection. Theoretically, thromboxane synthesis inhibitors or the receptor antagonists should improve renal function in these patients but there is no drug that is clinically available for that. Hypertension is associated with increased thromboxane and decreased prostacycline and prostaglandin E2 synthesis. So it is not known whether these changes are primary contributing factors or secondary response now. EGF2 alpha may also elevate blood pressure by regulating winning release in the kidney. <clears throat> for the Effects on the female reproductive organs. Uh, in animal studies, the PGE2 and the PGF2 alpha uh, in early reproductive processes, there is a role for these um, prostaglandins in ovulation, luteolysis, and fertilization. Uterine muscle is contracted by the PGF2 alpha, the thromboxane, and if uh, PGE2 is in low concentrations. And if it is in high concentrations of PGE2, it will cause relaxation as well as the prostacycline. The PGF2 alpha, together with the oxytocin, is also essential for the onset of parturition. PGI2 or the prostacycline also assists in promoting uterine smooth cell, smooth muscle cell maturation. For the male reproductive organs, the major source of these prostaglandins is the seminal vesicle. So despite the name prostaglandin, it is not the prostate that the, that the prostaglandins is synthesized. But they, but they synthesize small amounts of it, but mostly it is in the seminal vesicle. The factors that regulate the concentration of prostaglandins in human seminal plasma are not known in detail, but Testosterone does promote prostaglandin production. Thromboxane and leukotarians have not been found in seminal fluid. Men with a low seminal fluid concentration of prostaglandins are relatively infertile. And smooth muscle relaxing prostaglandins, such as PGE1, enhances the penile erection by relaxing the smooth muscle of the corpora cavernosa. So for the central and peripheral nervous system, for the fever, uh, the PGE2 increases the body temperature uh, predominantly through the EP3 receptor. However, EP1 can also play a role, especially if administered directly into the cerebral ventricles. <coughs> Exogenous PGF2 alpha and prostacycline also induces fever, uh, whereas the PGD2 and the Thromboxane does not. And the endogenous pyrogens release interleukin 1. Remember, interleukin 1 um, creates the fever, causes the fever, I mean, which in turn, if there's presence of interleukin 1, it promotes the synthesis and the release of the prostaglandin A2. This synthesis is also blocked by aspirin, other antipyretic NSAIDs, and paracetamol, paracetaminophen. For sleep, when increased into the cerebral ventricles, the prostaglandin D2 induces natural sleep by through the activation of the DT1 receptor and the secondary release of adenosine, while the PGE2 
inclusion into the posterior hypothalamus causes wakefulness. For neurotransmission, the prostaglandin E compounds, it inhibits release of norepinephrine from the postganglionic sympathetic nerve endings. NSAIDs increase norepinephrine release in vivo, which suggests that the prostaglandins play a physiologic role in the process. Vasoconstriction observed during treatment with COX inhibitors may be due in part to increased release of norepinephrine as well as the inhibition of the endothelial synthesis of the vasodilators prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline. Prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline are also, um, sensi uh, also sensitizes the peripheral nerve endings to painful stimuli. The prostaglandin E2 also acts on the EP1 and EP4 receptors to increase membrane excitability. Prostaglandins also modulate pain centrally, and both COX-1 and COX-2 are expressed in the spinal cord and release prostaglandins in response to peripheral pain stimuli. The prostaglandin and perhaps the other prostaglandins, I mean prostaglandin E2 and other prostaglandins and prostacyclins are contribute to the so-called central sensitization, which is an increase in excitability of the spinal dorsal horn, which uh, augments the pain intensity, widens the area of pain perception, and results in pain from normally innocuous stimuli. PGE2 acts on the EP2 receptor to facilitate the presynaptic release of the excitatory neurotransmitters and blocks the inhibitory glycinergic neurotransmission as well as postsynaptically enhance the excitatory neurotransmitter receptor activity. The PGE2 and the prostacycline are the predominant prostanoids associated with inflammation. So mark enhanced edema formation and leukocyte infiltration by promoting blood flow in the inflamed region. They increase the vascular permeability and leukocyte infiltration. Thromboxane, again, will increase the platelet leukocyte interactions. And prostaglandin E2 and thromboxane may also play a role in the T lymphocyte development by regulating apoptosis of immature thymocytes. Prostacycline contributes to the immune suppression by interfering with dendritic cell maturation. Prostaglandin E2 suppresses the immunologic response to man by inhibiting the differentiation of B lymphocytes into, into the plasma cells. It also inhibits the cytotoxic T cell function and the uh, mitogen stimulated proliferation of the T lymphocytes as well as the maturation and function of the T helper 1 lymphocytes. The prostaglandin E2 can also modify the myeloid cell differentiation, which promotes the type 2 immunosuppressive macrophage and myeloid suppressor cell phenotypes. The PGD2 is a major product of the mast cell, hence it is a potent chemotractant for eosinophils. It also induces the degranulation and leukotrien biosynthesis and induces the chemotaxis of the end migration of the, of the T helper to lymphocytes, mainly through the activation of the DIP2. In bone metabolism, prostaglandins are produced by the osteoblast and adjacent hematopoietic cells. So in other words, the major effect would be the increase in bone turnover that, or the stimulation of bone resorption and formation. It may also mediate the effects of mechanical forces on bones and changes in bones during inflammation. So POX inhibitors, since they inhibit the production of the prostaglandins, they also slow the skeletal muscle healing by interfering with the prostaglandin effect on myocyte proliferation, differentiation, and fibrosis in response to injury. So in other words, it is not advisable to take COX, to COX inhibitors if you have a fracture. Prostaglandins may also contribute to the bone loss that occur at menopause. It has been speculated that NSAIDs may be of therapeutic value in osteoporosis. However, uh, controlled evaluation of this intervention has not been carried out yet. 
and NSAIDs, especially those specific for inhibition of the COX-2, delay bone healing in experimental models of fracture. In the eye, the prostaglandins E, F, and D derivatives lower intraocular pressure. The mechanism of this action is still unclear, but probably involves increased outflow of the aqueous humor from the anterior chamber via the uveal scleral pathway. In cancer, uh, pharmacologic inhibition or the deletion of the COX-2 restrains tumor formation in models of colon, breast, lung, and other cancers. There is a large human epidemiologic study which found that the, which found that the incidental use of NSAIDs is associated with re reductions in the relative risk for developing the aforementioned cancers. Chronic low-dose aspirin does not appear, however, to have a substantial impact on cancer incidence, but it is associated with reduced cancer death in a number of studies. The anti-cancer efficacy of aspirin in humans may be related to the hyperactivity of the PA3 kinase slash AKT pathway in tumor cells. In patients with the familial polyposis coli, COX inhibitors significantly decrease the polyp formation. And there are also several studies that suggest that COX-2 expression is associated with the markers of tumor progression in breast cancer. Uh, for the prostaglandin E2, it is considered the principal oncogenic prostanoids. It facilitates the tumor initiation, progression, and metastasis. So basically, promoter here, the prostaglandin E2 is, the, is a promoter of cancer. In tumors, reduced level of the OATP2A1 and the 15 PGDH, which mediate the cellular uptake and metabolic inactivation of the PGE2 respectively likely contribute to the sustained PGE2 activity. The effects of the lipoxygenase and the cytochrome B450 derived metabolites, the lipoxygenase will generate compounds that, that can regulate specific cellular responses that are important in inflammation and immunity. Again, the lipoxygenase products are the leukotrienes. Cytochrome P450 derived metabolites affect the nephron transport functions either directly or via metabolism to active compounds. So in blood cells and inflammation, the LTB4 acts on the BLT1 receptor, is a potent chemoattractant for T lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and other white blood cells. Uh, they contribute to the activation of the neutrophils and eosinophils, as well as the adhesion of the monocyte to the endothelium. Cutinal leukotrienes, specifically the LTC4, the D4, and the LTE4, are potent chemotractants as well, but for eosinophils and T lymphocytes. They also generate distinct cells of cytokines through the activation of mast cells, <coughs> leukotrienes of mast cells, Cytinal leukotriene 1 and leukotriene 2 receptors. <clears throat> they also promote the sinophil adherence, uh, the granulation, cytokine, or chemokine release, and oxygen radical formation at higher concentrations. They also contribute to the inflammation by increasing the endothelial permeability. In, hence, it will promote the migration of the inflammatory cells to the site of inflammation. This strongly implicated, this is, uh, it is strongly implicated in the pathogenesis of inflammation like in asthma and inflammatory bowel disease. Lipoxins also have diverse effect on leukocytes, which includes the activation of the monocytes and macrophages, as well as inhibition of the neutrophil, eosinophil, and lymphocyte activation. Both lipoxin A and B inhibit the natural killer cell cytotoxicity. In the um, heart and smooth muscle, uh, in the vascular smooth muscle, the, the urethrine B4 may cause vasoconstriction as well as smooth muscle cell migration and proliferation. The LTC and the LTD4 reduce 
myocardial contractility and coronary blood flow leading to the depression of the cardiac output and subsequently the decrease in the blood pressure. Lipoxin A and lipoxin B exerts coronary vasoconstrictor effects in vitro, but uh, in vivo has not yet been um, observed. In addition to their vasodilatory actions, the EETs may reduce cardiac hypertrophy as well as systemic and pulmonary vascular smooth muscle proliferation and migration. For the gastrointestinal, human colonic epithelial cells synthesize LTB4, uh, which is a chemical attractant for neutrophils. It also appears in the activation of the BLT2 receptor through the agonist other than LTB4 is protective in the colonic epithelium and contributes to the maintenance of the barrier function. The cysteine leukotrienes are potent bus constrictors in the airways and they cause increased microvascular permeability, secretion, leukosecretion, and plasma oxidation in the airways. The LTC4 specific receptors have not been found in the human lung tissue ever, whereas both high and low affinity LTD4 receptors are present. In the renal system, there is substantial evidence for a role of the epoxygenase products in the regulation of the renal function. So, however, the, the, their exact role in the kidney is still, still unclear. So, we have the 20 HEPE and the EETs generated in the renal tissue, wherein the 20 HEPE or the 20 hydroxy acosatinoic acid potently blocks the smooth muscle cell potassium channel and leads to the vasoconstriction of the renal arteries. And it has been implicated in the pathogenesis of hypertension. In contrast, studies support an anti-hypertensive effect of the EET because of their vasodilating and not diuretic action. EETs increases renal blood flow and may protect against inflammatory renal damage by limiting glomerular macrophage infiltration. Inhibitors of soluble, the SEH, are be also being developed as potential new antihypertensive drugs. The 12 HETE stimulates the release of aldosterone in the adrenal cortex and mediates a portion of the aldosterone release stimulated by the angiotensin 2, but not by the adrenocorticotropic hormone. Very low concentrations of the LTC4 increase and higher concentration of, of arachidonic acid derived tapoxide augment the luteinizing hormone and the luteinizing hormone releasing hormone released from the isolated rat anterior pituitary cells. Corticosteroids block all the known pathways of the eicosanoid synthesis. So partly by stimulating the synthesis of several inhibitory proteins collectively called as the annexins or the lipocortins. What they do is they inhibit the phospholipase A2 activity. So in other words, the arachidonic acid will not be released from the membrane phospholipid. The NSAIDs will block the, both the prostaglandin and the thromboxin formation by reversibly inhibiting COX activity. The traditional NSAIDs are, are not selective to COX-1 or COX-2, but the aspirin is, a, is an NSAID that is an irreversible COX inhibitor. In platelets, COX-1 cannot be restored by a protein biosynthesis, which results in extended inhibition of the thromboxine biosynthesis. <coughs> Although they remain less effective than inhaled corticosteroids, the 5 lipoxygenase inhibitor, the zeliotone, and the selective antagonist of the systemic leukotriene 1 receptor for leukotrienes, the safmirlucas, motilucas, and the panlucas, are used in mild to moderate asthma. NSAIDs do not inhibit uh, lipoxygenase active activity usually at concentrations obtained clinically, which inhibits the cyclophagenase activity. In fact, by preventing the arachidonic acid conversion through the cyclooxygenase pathway, the, the NSAIDs may cause more substrate to 
be metabolized through the lipoxygenase pathway, which would lead to the increased formation of the lipotriens. The drugs that inhibit both cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase are being developed, like the darbufelone, which has shown promise in the studies of cancer cells in mouse tumor models, since darbufelone is a COX-2 and the 5 lipoxygenase inhibitor. For the pharmacology of eicosanoids, there are several approaches that have been used in the clinical application of eicosanoids. First, the use of the stable oral or parenteral long-acting analogs of the naturally occurring prostaglandins. The second is the use of enzyme, enzyme inhibitors and receptor antagonists to interfere with the synthesis of our effects of the eicosanoids. And the third one is the efforts of dietary manipulation, wherein uh, the, the reason for this is to change the polyunsaturated fatty acid precursor in the cell membrane phospholipid. So instead of lactidonic acid, other fatty acid precursor will be um, observed in the membrane phospholipid. And so we'll change the eicosanoid synthesis. Uh, it is used extensively in over-the-counter products and in diets in fine sizing increased consumption of cold water fishes. So discovery of the COX-2 as a major source of the inflammatory prostanoids led to the development of selective COX-2 inhibitors in order to preserve the function of the COX-1, which is to preserve the gastrointestinal and renal function thereby reducing toxicity. The marked decrease in biosynthesis of the prostacycline that follows the COX-2 inhibition without the concurrent inhibition of the platelet COX-1 derived from boxin removes a protective constraint on endogenous mediators of the cardiovascular dysfunction. So it leads to an increase in cardiovascular events in patients taking selective COX-2 inhibitors. Okay. In the female reproductive organs, the COX-1 derived uh, PGF2 alpha appears important for the luteolysis, which is consistent with the delayed parturition in the COX-1 deficient mice. There is a complex interplay between the PGF2 alpha and oxytocin. Uh, it is critical to the onset of the labor. The EV2 receptor deficient mice demonstrated a pre-implantation defect, which underlies some of the breeding difficulties seen in COX-2 knockouts. In other words, the LP2 receptor, it is possible that the females who are unable to conceive might have deficiency in the LP2 receptors. Processive reproduction also leads to the maturation of uterine smooth muscle cells prior to labor. In abortion, uh, PGE2 and the PGF2 alpha have potent oxytocin action. The ability to terminate pregnancy at any stage by promoting uterine contraction has been adapted to common clinical use. Many studies worldwide have established that prostaglandin efficiently terminates pregnancy, and the drugs are used for the first and second trimester abortion and for priming or ripening the cervix before abortion. These prostaglandins appear to soften the cervix by increasing the protective glycan content and change the biophysical properties of collagen. Dinoprostone is a synthetic preparation of the prostaglandin E2, and it is administered vaginally for oxytocin use. In the USA, it is approved for inducing abortion in the second trimester of the pregnancy. Also used for missed abortion, for benign hydrativity for mole, and for the ripening of the cervix for the induction of labor. Dinoprostone also stimulates the conduction of the uterus throughout the pregnancy. And as the pregnancy progresses, the uterus increases its contractile response, and the contractile effect of oxytocin is potentiated as well. 
Dinoproston also directly affects the collagenase of the cervix, which results to its softening. It is metabolized in the local tissues and on the first pass through the lungs. Metabolites are mainly excreted in the urine and the plasma half-life of the dinoproston is 2.5 to 5 minutes. For abortifacient purposes, the recommended dose for dinoproston is 20 mg dinoproston vaginal suppository repeated at 3 to 5 hour intervals depending on the response of the uterus. The mean time to abortion using this drug is 17 hours, but in more than 25% of cases, the abortion is incomplete. Hence, it requires additional intervention. Antiprogestins like the mifepristone have been combined with oral oxytocin synthetic analog like the misoprostol in order to produce early abortion. Its ease of use and the effectiveness of the combination have aroused considerable opposition in some quarters. The major toxicity of this combination of drugs are cramping pain and diarrhea. And the oral and vaginal routes of administration are equally, equally effective. However, the vaginal route ha has been associated with increased incidence of sepsis. So oral route is now recommended. Carboprost, tromethamine, which is a 15-methyl TGF2-alpha, is also used to induce the second trimester abortion. It is an analog of the PGF2-alpha. And the 15-methyl group attached to the PGF2-alpha is the one that prolongs the duration of action for this um, medication or for this substance. Um, controlled postpartum hemorrhage is not, is not responding to conventional methods of management. Carbon process also used for that. The success rate of, of this substance is approximately 80% and is administered through a single 250 micrograms intramuscular injection, but is re repeated if necessary. Vomiting and diarrhea occur commonly, probably because of the stimulation of the gastrointestinal smooth muscle serotonin receptor. And in some patients, transient bronchoconstriction can occur. Present elevations in temperature are also seen in approximately one-eighth of patients. For the facilitation of labor, PGE2 and PGF2-alpha, as well as their analogs, can effectively initiate and stimulate labor. But PGF2-alpha is one-tenth as potent as PGE2. But in the efficacy of of these two prostaglandins, there's no difference if they are both administered intravenously. The most common usage is the local application of the prostaglandin E2 in order to promote labor by ripening the ripening of the cervix. The agents and oxytocin also have similar success rates and comparable induction to delivery intervals. Adverse effects of the prostaglandin are moderate, with a slightly higher incidence of nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea compared to oxytocin. PGF2-alpha also has more GI toxicity than the prostaglandin E2. Neither drug has significant maternal cardiovascular toxicity in the recommended dose, and PGE2 must be infused at a rate about 20 times faster than that used for induction of labor to decrease blood pressure and increase heart rate. PGF2-alpha is also a bronchoconstrictor. That's why it should be used with caution if, not, if the pregnant female has asthma. However, neither asthma attacks nor bronchoconstriction have been observed during the induction of labor using this uh, PGF2-alpha. Although, both, although both PGE2 and PGF2-alpha pass the fetal placental barrier, there is no, um, the incidence of fetal toxicity is also uncommon. For the induction of labor or softening the cervix, dinoproston can be used as either as a gel or as a controlled release vaginal insert. For, for gel, uh, should be given 0.5 milligrams of PGE2 every six hours with a maximum 24 hour cumulative dose of 1.5 milligrams. For the controlled release vaginal insert, uh, it is 
at 10 mg of PGE2, which releases the PGE2 over 12 hours. The advantage of using the controlled release is a lower incidence of the gastrointestinal effects. The softening of the cervix for induction of labor substantially shortens uh, the time to onset of labor and the delivery time. The effect of oral PGE2 administration have been compared with those of the IV oxytocin and oral demoxytocin, and was noted that the oral PGE2 is superior to the oral oxytocin derivative. And in most studies, it is also as efficient as the IV oxytocin. Oral PGF2 alpha causes too much GI toxicity to be useful by this route. Uh, route. There, theoretically, the prostaglandin E2 and the prostaglandin F2 alpha should be superior to oxytocin for inducing labor with preeclampsia, eclampsia, or cardiac and renal disease. Because unlike oxytocin, the prostaglandin has no antidiuretic effect. In addition, the prostaglandin E2 has no theoretic effect, which would cause a uh, decrease in blood pressure. However, clinical benefits of this effect have not been documented yet. In case of fetal death in utero, the prostaglandins alone or combined with oxytocin uh, seem to cause the delivery effect effectively. It would be easier for the patient to deliver the, the baby. For dysmenorrhea, primary dysmenorrhea, there is increased endometrial synthesis of prostaglandin E2 and PGF2 alpha during menstruation with contractions of the uterus, which leads to the pain. NSAIDs uh, successfully inhibits this from the formation of these prostaglandins hence relieving them from dysmenorrhea in 75 to 85% of cases. Aspirin is also effective in dysmenorrhea, but since it has low potency and is quickly hydrolyzed, uh, large doses and frequent administration are necessary. In addition, the acetylation of platelet tox causes in causing irreversible inhibition of the thromboxane synthesis may increase the amount of menstrual bleeding. That's why uh, aspirin is not really um, it's not really preferred in this malaria. In, uh, in the male reproductive system, intracavernosal inter injection or transuretral suppository with alprostagil is a second line treatment for erectile dysfunction. Uh, the, therap the management will include injected doses of up to 2.5 to 25 micrograms, but suppositories are recommended to start at 125 micrograms or 250 up to 1,000 micrograms. Penile pain is a frequent side effect of a prostadil, which may be related to the algesic effect of the prostaglandin E derivatives. However, only a few patients discontinue the use of this medication because of pain. Prolonged erection and priapism are also side effects, which occur in less than 4% of patients and are minimized by the careful treatment to the minimal effective dose. When given by in injection, a prostadil may be used as monotherapy or can be and also be combined with papaverine or fentolamine. In the renal system, uh, increased biosynthesis of prostaglandin has been associated with one form of Barter syndrome. Barter syndrome is a rare disease characterized by low to normal blood pressure and with decreased sensitivity to the angiot angiotensin, hyperinemia, hyperaldosteronism, and excessive loss of potassium. There also is an increased excretion of prostaglandins, especially the metabolites of the prostaglandin E in the urine. After a long-term administration of clox inhibitor in order to prevent the synthesis of prostaglandins, which causes the Barter syndrome, uh, the sensitivity to angiotensin, plasma running values, and the concentration of aldosterone in the plasma returns to normal. Okay. 
Although plasma potassium rises, it remains low and urinary wasting of potassium persists. Whether an increase in prostaglandin biosynthesis is the cause of Parker syndrome or is a reflection of a more basic physiologic defect is not yet known. In the cardiovascular system, pulmonary hypertension, the prostacycline will lower the peripheral pulmonary and coronary vascular resistance. I'm okay. Pulmonary hypertension is characterized by an increase in vascular resistance in the pulmonary blood vessels. Prostacycline has been used to treat pulmonary hypertension arising from, the, from a primary lung disease and that arising from heart or systemic diseases. In addition, prostacycline is also used successfully to treat portopulmonary hypertension, which is secondary to liver disease. The first commercial preparation of prostacycline is the eproprostenol. It improves the symptoms, prolongs survival, and delays or prevents the need for lung or lung heart transplantation. The side effects of the epoprostenol is flushing, headache, hypotension, nausea, and diarrhea. The extremely short plasma half-life, which is at three to five minutes of epoprostenol, necessitates continuous IV infusion through a central line for long-term treatment. So here are other medications uh, for pulmonary hypertension. We have iloprost, which is usually inhaled six to nine times a day, although it has been delivered by IV administration outside the USA. Leprostinil, which has a half-life of about four hours, can be delivered subcutaneously or intravenously or through inhalation. Recently, there are two oral prostacycline receptor agonists that are approved by the FDA. We have Selexipad and the Teprostinil. For the peripheral vascular diseases, there are a number of studies that investigate the use of the prostaglandin E1 and the prostacycline in Raynaud's phenomenon. However, uh, st these studies are mostly small and uncontrolled, and these therapies do not have an established place in the treatment of the peripheral vascular diseases. It is not yet, it is not yet used. For the patent ductus arteriosus, the potency of the fetal ductus arteriosus depends on the prostaglandin E2 that acts on the EP4 receptor. At birth, there, there is a reduction of the prostaglandin E2 levels, and because of the and because of it, it allows the ductus arteriosus to close. And in certain types of congenital heart diseases like transposition, what we need to what we want is to maintain the potency of this ductus arteriosus, especially in the transposition of the great artery, since the oxygenated blood and the deoxygenated blood will not be able to go through its appropriate circulation. So it can, can it can cause death. So the potency must be must be preserved. So un well until corrective surgery can be carried out. So what what they what they've done is they use the alprostadil, which is a prostaglandin E1. And it helps in the in the maintenance of the potency of the ductus arteriosus. Okay, the adverse effects would include the apnea, bradycardia, hypotension, and hyperpyrexia. And because of rapid pulmonary clearance, the drug must be continuously infused at an initial rate of 0.05 to 0.1 micrograms per kilogram per minute, which may be increased to 0.4. Prolonged treatment has been associated with ductal fragility and rupture, so it is also not advisable for the medication to be prolonged. In delayed closure of the ductus arteriosus, the tox inhibitors are also often used to inhibit the synthesis of PGE2 and so close and so close the ductus. So they, we can also use the COX inhibitors in order to maintain the potency of the ductus arteriosus. Premature infants in whom respiratory distress develops due to the failure of the ductus closure can be, de, de, can be treated with a high degree of success with, with endomethacine. 
And this treatment often precludes the need for surgical closure of the ductus. So we can try first. If we want the ductus arteriosus to close, we can use the indometacine and we can do this, the pharmacologic therapy before, before considering surgical closure. Because maybe it can still close on its own. In the blood, uh, again, the troboxane, it promotes plated aggregation, well, PGI2, and perhaps the PGE2 and the PGD2 inhibits the aggregation. The chronic administration of the low dose aspirin will irreversibly inhibit the platelet tox 1, and the dominant product of the platelet tox 1 is the troboxane. So without, and without modifying the activity of the non-platelet tox 1 or tox 2. The thromboxane, in addition to activating the platelets, also amplifies the response to other platelet agonists. Hence, inhibition of its synthesis inhibits secondary aggregation of platelets induced by the adenosine diphosphate, by low concentrations of thrombin and collagen, and by epinephrine. Because their effects are reversible within the typical dosing interval, the non-selective NSAIDs do not reproduce this effect. Although naproxen, because of its variably prolonged half-life, may provide antiquated benefit in some individuals. Given the absence of toxin platelets, selective tox inhibitors do not alter the platelet thromboxin biosynthesis and are not platelet inhibitors. However, tox 2 derived prostacyclin generation is substantially suppressed if, if being given with the tox 2 inhibitors. Hence, uh, it would uh, it will remove a restraint on the cardiovascular action of the thromboxine and other platelet agonists. Selective depression of the prostacyclin generation explains the increase in vascular events, particularly major coronary events in humans treated with a coxid or selective NSAIDs. High dose ibuprofen may also confer a similar risk, whereas high dose. Naproxen appears to be neutral with respect to the thrombotic risk. All NSAIDs appear to increase the risk of heart failure. And large clinical studies have, cle have now clearly demonstrated secondary prevention of adverse cardiovascular events. Um, they prevent a second event after an, an initial event through the use of the low dose aspirin. There is also some evidence that low-dose aspirin can confer primary cardiovascular protection, particularly in high cardiovascular risk population. However, low-dose aspirin also elevates the, the risk of serious GI bleeding about twofold over the placebo. In the respiratory system, the prostaglandins, especially the E2, is a powerful bronchodilator when given in aerosol form. Also promotes coughing, and an analog that possesses only the bronchodilator properties has been difficult to obtain. The PGF, PGF2 alpha and thromboxane are bronch bronchoconstrictors and were once thought to be primary mediators in asthma. However, the systemic leukotrienes probably dominate during asthmatic constriction of the airways. So it's not the PGF2 alpha and TXA2 that are the mediators primary mediators in asthma, but it's possibly these systemic leukotrienes. A lipoxygenase inhibitor, zeolutone, has also been used in asthma, but it's not as popular as the receptor inhibitors. Corticosteroids and chromoline are also useful in asthma. They inhibit the eicosanoid synthesis and thus limit the amount of eicosanoid mediator available for release. They appear to inhibit the release of eicosanoids and other mediators such as histamine and platelet activating factor from mast cells. For the gastrointestinal system, the word cytoprotection signifies the remarkable protective effect of the prostaglandin E against peptic ulcer in animals at doses that do not reduce acid secretion. The misoprostol is an oral activity orally active synthetic analog of the prostaglandin E1. And it is indicated 
for the prevention of N cell induced peptic ulcers, but it is also under pregnancy category X drug because it is also an abortifacient that cause abortion. These and other prostaglandin E analogs are cytoprotective at low doses and inhibit gastric acid secretion at high doses. Misoprostol use is also low, probably because of the, of the side effect, which includes the abdominal discomfort and diarrhea. Those dependent bone pain and hyperostosis have also been described in patients with liver disease who were given a long-term E prostaglandin treatment. Selective COX-2 inhibitors were developed in, in an effort to spare the COX-1 in the GI. So in order for the natural cytoprotection to be maintained, which is uh, done by the locally synthesized prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline. For the immune system, the T and B lymphocytes are not primary synthetic sources, but they may supply arachidonic acid to the monocyte macrophages for the eicosanoid biosynthesis. Prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline limits the T lymphocyte proliferation in vitro as well as the corticosteroids. The prostaglandin E2 also inhibits the B lymphocyte differentiation and the antigen presenting fraction of the myeloid derived cells. In other words, the prostaglandins also suppresses the immune response. T-cell clonal expansion is attenuated through inhibition of interleukin-1 and interleukin-2 and class 2 antigen expression by the macrophages or other antigen-presenting cells. Thromboxane, leukotriens, and platelet activating factors stimulate the T-cell clonal expansion. They stimulate the formation of interleukin-1 and interleukin-2 as well as the expression of the interleukin-2 receptors. The leukotrienes also promote the interferon gamma release and can replace the interleukin-2 as a stimulator for the interferon gamma. The prostaglandin D2 induces the chemotaxis and the migration of the T-helper-2 lymphocytes. In inflammation, uh, COX-2 appears to be the form of the enzyme most associated with the cells that is involved in the inflammation. Although, COX-1 also contributes significantly to prostaglandin biosynthesis during inflammation. So aspirin, again, is an irre irreversible uh, COX inhibitor. It has been used to treat arthritis. Uh, pero the, even though it was being used in, in arthritis, because they, they, uh, they observed that it is uh, it can help in the in inflammation, to alleviate the inflammation. They did not know that it, the, the activity of the aspirin is to inhibit the COX until 1971. For rheumatoid arthritis, immune complexes are deposited in the joints, which causes an inflammatory response that is amplified by eicosanoids. The lymphocytes and macrophages accumulate in the synovium, while the leukocytes uh, locate, localized mainly in the synovial fluid. Major eicosanoids produced by the leukocytes in the synovial fluid are the leukotrienes, which facilitate the T-cell proliferation and acts as a chemotractant. The human macrophages synthesizes the COX products, prostaglandin E2, and thromboxane, and large amounts of leukotrienes. In glaucoma, uh, the first prostanoid used for glaucoma is a stable long-acting PGF2 alpha derivative, which is the latanoprost. The success of, of this medication has stimulated the development of similar prostanoids with ocular hypotensive effect like the bimatoprost and the travoprost. This act, these drug, drugs act at the FP receptor and are administered as drops into the conjunctival sac once or twice daily. And the adverse effects from these medications are irreversible brown pigmentation of the iris and eyelashes, drying of the eyes, and conjunctivitis. 
Bimatoplus is, is FDA approved for the treatment of the hypotrichosis in the eyelash and has shown efficacy in enhancing eyelash growth after chemotherapy. Hypotrichosis is different from alopecia because alopecia is the absence of hair mismo, while the hypotrichosis is uh, parang delayed growth of the hair, parang little or less, lesser growth than normal of hair. It, uh, it is applied to the eyelashes in a 0.03% solution to the skin at the base of the upper lashes. And a common but minor adverse effect is darkening of eyelid skin due to the increased melanin production. But it's reversible if the if bimatoplus will be discontinued. There are also trials that demonstrate the efficacy of bimatoplus in eyebrow hypotrichosis. And there are uh, studies that suggest that this drug may also have use in treating alopecia. The third approach would be the dietary manipulation of the arachidonic acid uh, metabolism. So the effects of the dietary manipulation on arachidonic acid metabolism have been extensively, extensively studied. So the dietary intake of the linoleic and alkalinolenic acid, which is omega-6 and omega-3, can modify the arachidonic acid metabolism and the nature of the eicosanoids produced. So there are two approaches. It's either first, you add corn, safflower, or sunflower oils in the diet, which allows for the generation of one series prostaglandins via the dihomo gamma linoleic acid. The second approach is to add oils from cold water fish, which contains the omega-3 fatty acid, the C25, the ecosyopentaenoic or the doco, and the docosa, docosa hexaenoic acid. Diets high in fish oil have been shown to impact indices of platelet and leukocyte function, blood pressure, and triglycerides with different dose response relationship. There is a, an abundance of epidemiolo epidemiologic data saying that the diet high in fatty fish can have a reduction in the incidence of the MI and the sudden cardiac death. Um, with na lasting here na omega-3 good for the heart. Although there is more ambiguity about stroke. However, the studies, um, the studies that show this uh, result actually have other cofactors included in the in the included in their lifestyle. So it's not just a uh, uh, high in fatty fish alone. The diet is uh, a monotonous diet. So they also have other healthy lifestyle behaviors. So there, because of that, there is the question if there is really a uh, um, cardiovascular cardiovascular benefit of the dietary omega-3 fatty acids. So that's it. Uh, we were done. Sabto out oh, nag nag sobrahin two minutes. So that's it for the two chapters that I am that I was assigned. So thank you for listening. And we are going to have a quiz on Sanato. December one. Tama ba? December one po dok. Apo. Okay. <laughs> na ako na may na niya other nurses, but it's okay. I don't mind. I'm not offended. Don't worry. <laughs> anyway, may da ba kamo questions? Pero since it's already three, may da kamo. When is your next one? Oh, uh, I mean. What, when is your next lecture? What time? Pedia. <laughs> <laughs>